How do we say thank you to those who gave everything? How do we honor the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom? We say thank you by remembering. Today, we honor our heroes. Lives given, not in vain, but with purpose. We stand grateful for their courage, their strength, and their resolve. For the fabric of America is stitched together by the thread of the brave. Today, we remember, and we will never forget. Let's pray for those who've given so much. Oh Lord, we thank you for those who followed the ultimate Christ-like example of sacrifice, laying down their life for the sake of others. And so, Father, on this weekend, we weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Father, we're asking that you would comfort moms and dads and children and spouses as only you can. Help them feel your strong presence as they feel their strong loss. May they see your tender hand all around them and hear your voice directing them in dark circumstances. Draw them daily to your word to process their pain and grieve with hope. Spur the body of Christ around them to be your hands and feet and to meet their practical needs. Amen. Really, I'd like to welcome everyone. We have some new faces and we probably have some new faces online. And so we're, we're just glad you're here on this uh, Lord's Day. This is a good day, right? It's raining outside. It's warm in here, right? We've got a roof over our head. Right? We're excited. One of the great things about living in this country, and there are many great things, if you've never traveled outside the U.S., you don't know how blessed you are. If you ever go to a third world or developing country in the midst of chaos, you'll understand how great a country you live in. But one of the, one of the great things about this country is that we have access to such advanced health care. Right? I mean, you have some type of malady, you could probably call the doc in a box and get there and, you know, he can help you out. But uh, in other countries, they deal with all types of problems. One of the great problems in some parts of the world is the disease of leprosy, a terrifying thing when I say the word leprosy. I mean, when we think of the word, word leprosy, one word that's attached to this disease is the word unclean. You know, we used to joke around as kids, you know, when we were smelling kind of foul because you know how sometimes young boys don't take baths very often, you know, unclean, unclean, you know, it was a reference to leprosy. Uh, This disease of leprosy uh, has been around for a long time, even in our modern world. Uh, And the word unclean is attached to it. The bishop, Fulton J. Sheen, tells this story. It's kind of a funny story. Uh, where he was uh, a refined English woman approached him and uh, with her English accent, which I'm not going to try to repeat. I tried it in first service and it was horrible. I don't know what I sounded like, but it was bad. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let me do it. Is that what you're saying? No. But anyway, <laughs> she's my neighbor. Uh, so I know her well. Uh, this woman says, uh, I, I, I'm interested in your faith. I would like to become a Catholic, she says to the bishop. Uh, but not. I don't want to be instructed by some ordinary priest. I'd like to, uh, I'm an intellectual, so I'd like an intellectualized pr- uh, proposition of your faith. And so the bishop responded, Madame... I'm willing to instruct anyone that comes to me. As a matter of fact, a young man who, had lep- who has leprosy was sitting in the chair you were sitting in, and I just, finished, I just finished giving him instructions. At that word, she ran out of the house, right? And why not? 
because she was terrified of getting this terrible disease, leprosy. From the beginning, leprosy has been one of the most horrible diseases on the earth. As a matter of fact, it's the oldest recorded disease of all time. Guinness Book of World Records puts leprosy as uh, recorded, first recorded in 1350 B.C. And so uh, back in the, in the days of Egypt, uh, it, 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 it showed itself. And so we know it's been around a long time. And the word unclean is associated with this terrible disease. Now, if you're new to Cornerstone, if this is your first time here, we are going through a deep year-long dive into the life of Christ, and we're using a tool called Quest 52. And if you'd like to purchase one of these books or, or just take one, if you don't have 10 bucks on you, you can pick one up just outside these doors. But anyway, the question that we're wrestling with this week from this series is, can Jesus make me clean? Now, this was one of the biggest hurdles that I ever faced in coming to Jesus. You know, because you and I carry around a lot of baggage when we first meet Jesus. And, and matter of fact, we spend the rest of our life kind of shedding all these things that we shouldn't be carrying around. And I don't know about you, but I had a lot of baggage I was carrying when I first met Jesus. And, you know, I came to church one day, and the uh, preacher talked about becoming clean in Jesus. And in that moment, I knew I was good, and I, and I never thought about it again. No, that did not happen. That was a lie. I wrestled with it for years, and even to this day, when I foul up, when I sin, I think about becoming clean again in the presence of my Father. Can I get a witness? Is anybody with me? Are you tracking with me? All right, all right. So this is a common problem, right? This is a common issue. As a matter of fact, my guess is that someone who walked in here today and they're wrestling with guilt and shame uh, and, and just coming to church kind of makes you feel uncomfortable. Well, there's a man with leprosy who meets Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And the scripture says, a man came and met Jesus who had leprosy. Now, that understates <laughs> this encounter dramatically. Uh, I mean, this is an offensive thing for a leper to come into the presence of a non-leper like Jesus. Leprosy was a widespread disease in Palestine. We have many examples of Jesus curing lepers. In Palestine, there is, is, is comprised mainly of Jews, right? Uh, this is where they live, and they had a oral version of the Ten Commandments, or what we would call the law, and it was called the Mishnah. So the Mishnah was what they would remit, what they would uh, uh, memorize, and the Mishnah had a lot of rules about staying away from lepers. Like you had to be so much apart. They had to live in their own community. You couldn't go near them. And so there was all types of barriers between lepers and non-lepers. And so rabbis regarded, rabbi, those are the people who were the teachers of the law to the Jewish people. The rabbis regarded leprosy as humanly incurable. Couldn't be cured by human Hands. It had to be divine intervention, had to be an act of God. Leprosy had not only the reputation of being highly contagious, but it had the reputation of being a curse from God for some type of sin. And so there's, there's, the, there's the physical ailment, which is tragic, which is horrible, but it's also attached to it this stigma of being a sinner that is unredeemable. Okay, and so uh, it was a, a fate equal to death. Now, you have to have that background and some more, which we'll get into in just a moment, to understand the story we're about to read in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. A man with leprosy came to him, meaning Jesus, and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, can, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself <clears throat> to the priest 
and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, <laughs> like we would do different, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet people still came to him from everywhere. Now, if this is the first story you ever read about Jesus, if someone said, let me read you a story about Jesus, and they read this story to you, or you read it on your own, what would you conclude about Jesus? Good guy, bad guy? Good guy, right? Yeah, you can answer. This is church. You can talk. All right, as long as you don't fact check me on the internet or some stupid thing like that. It wasn't 1350 BC, it was 1325, Bob, you know, whatever. <laughs> you can go. All right, so uh, good guy or bad guy? Good guy. Compassionate or, or indifferent? Compassionate. Kind or mean? Kind. Selfless or selfish? Selfless, right? I mean, you just, you just read this story at first glance and you're like, I like this Jesus guy. He's a good guy. The Gospels are full of stories like that where Jesus is a good guy. Like, he's a great guy. But what I want to do this morning is I want to peel back some layers of understanding. And I want to move us all from just liking Jesus to worshiping him as God. So, so I don't know why you came to church today. I don't know if this is too heavy for you. But <clears throat> at some point in our life, we have to move from seeing Jesus just as, as a really great man to seeing him, seeing him as the God-man. Because that's the difference that really changes us. So we're going to peel back some layers here. And all three of the Gospels record this miracle. Actually, uh, John references Jesus healing uh, the lepers as well. But we're going to have to uh, take a deeper look into grasping what's just taken place because this miracle changes all the categories that a Jew would have about sin and God and being clean. All right? So... Let's dive in a little bit deeper. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, came to him. All right, so first of all, that's shocking. It may not be shocking to us because we're used to sick people going to the doctor, but it was shocking in that day, in the first century, when Jesus was alive, lepers just didn't come to people in general, certainly not to Jesus. They had to keep six feet at least social distance. You know, some of us understand a little bit about social distancing now, don't we? I mean, we get that, right? But in their day, like, this was like, if you got within that close, you certainly have caught a life-threatening disease. Because, and this is important, everyone believed that uncleanness passed to the clean. It was profound when I wrote it down. I don't know as good as you, but it was really profound, right? So this leper, he's approaching Jesus. All right, so if you read this account in Matthew chapter 8, there are three chapters that precede Matthew chapter 8. You don't know what they are? They're 5, 6, and 7. They teach you that at Bible college, all right? I mean, you're learning all kinds of stuff today. It's all free. (laughs) That's the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preaches this grand sermon. It is just revolutionary. Jesus is introducing the kingdom of God, and people are blown away in what he says. And right after the sermon ends, Jesus is beginning to walk away from the crowd, and he meets this guy, this leper. Now, for this leper to get that close to Jesus, he probably has some bleeding on his face from the rocks that have certainly been thrown at him, because that was part of the law. See a leper throw a rock, right? And so uh, it's this terrible, terrible uh, uh, social interaction that's going on here in the mind of any clean Jew. And so this leper, notice, doesn't ask, can you make me clean? Rather, he asks what? Will you? Are you willing? Uh, Are you willing to make 
me clean. This guy saw something in G- or heard something about Jesus that convinced him he was divine or in that same category with God. Maybe it was Maybe it was what he heard in the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe he could hear it. Or maybe he heard about someone being healed. But this is the first time anyone has ever approached Jesus and asked to be healed, asked to be made clean. And so Jesus, maybe it was the way he spoke with authority. Maybe it was his compassion. We don't know. But this man is convinced Jesus can make him clean. But is he willing? I know you can do it, Jesus. But are you willing? Now, why Why would he wonder if Jesus is willing? Well, now we have to go back and understand the big picture in the Old Testament about, uh, about sin, leprosy, get a historical perspective. All right, so if you've never been to church before, if this is your first time, if no one's ever told you this, there, the, the, uh, the earth starts out with creation. There you go. And in creation, God creates a temple garden, and he, he, first man and woman, Adam and Eve, they live in fellowship. And everything's great and good until Satan shows up, and he tempts them, and they sin, and that's what we call the fall. So they fall from grace. Their, God separates himself from their sinfulness. God separates himself from their, follow me, uncleanness, and they're pushed out of the temple garden, Okay. And then things get worse. (laughs) There's a flood. It's really bad. And then God raises up from the descendants of Noah a man named Abraham. And he gives Abraham these promises. Four, actually. One of them we're going to talk about. That that someone will come and redeem everyone. All right. So there's a promise. And along with that promise is a miraculously born child through them because they were of old age. And, And from that child, from that descendant, from the descendant of Sarah... And Abraham, son Isaac, and then grows a family. And then that family winds up in Egypt. And that family is in Egypt for a long time. And they multiply and multiply and multiply. And they become a great nation. We call that the Hebrew nation. And there's a problem there. They're in slavery. And Pharaoh hates them and hates their God and hates everything about them. And so he begins to uh, really uh, crush down on them. God raises up a deliverer. His name is Moses. And Moses comes and he leads the people out of Egypt. You've seen the movie, right? Charlton Heston? Okay, maybe you haven't. But you should. It's a pretty good movie. All right. Anyway, God leads them out to a wilderness called Sinai, the Sinai Desert. God's on the mountain. The mountain is shaking. Moses goes up and gets the law. He comes back down. And one of the instructions that Moses has given is build a tabernacle. Simple word for tent. Okay, a tent. And in this tent, God's presence would dwell. So the tabernacle, it has two compartments or two rooms, all right? One room is called the holy place, and that's where the priests would go in, and they would uh, do certain sacrifices and incense and, 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 and table of showbread. We don't have time to get in that. But then there's this other smaller place, 15 by 15 by 15 feet. It's called the holy place. Once a year, this guy called the high priest goes in on their Jewish New Year, the Day of Atonement, and he makes atonement for the sins of Israel. All right, now, it's a terrifying thing to walk into the holy presence of God. As a matter of fact, it's so dangerous that there was all these rituals of cleaning that had to be done, all these rituals they had to perform for them to even go in there. And in case they lied about something, they tied a rope around their ankle. So if they dropped dead, they could pull them out because they can't walk in there and get them. And you don't want a stinking body laying inside your holy place, right? Like that's just not cool. All right. All right, aren't you glad that these rules aren't in effect now? Yeah, I mean, there'd be lots of ropes, right? (laughs) Yeah, you're really glad you came. That preacher said I dropped dead. All right, so now at Sinai, God gives the people a book we call Leviticus. The book of the law. I know it's your favorite book in the Bible, right? (laughs) Everybody here loves reading Leviticus. Let me read you one of the verses from Leviticus. God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. 
I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Be what? Holy. We sang a song today where we repeated the phrase, holy, 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 right? Like, be holy because God is holy. That's why we're to be holy. Now, the reason God led them out to Sinai was so that they would trust completely on Him. Do you know the land of Goshen where the, where the, where the Israelites lived in Egypt is the most fertile ground in the world. Topsoil is over 100 feet deep. The topsoil. There is almost a line in the sand, no pun intended, from Goshen to the Sinai Desert. Nothing grows in Sinai but deadly things, right? Terrible, deadly, scary things. And, and, and so they have to depend totally on God. And then now that God's got their attention, he puts himself right in the middle of the neighborhood. So there are 12 tribes of Israel, and God organized them, three tribes on this side, three tribes on this side, three tribes on this side, three tribes on this side. And guess who's in the center? The tabernacle, God's presence. And there's always a plume of smoke in the daytime and a plume of fire at night so that they never forget God. And the first thing they see when they walk out of their tent is God's presence. God has moved into the neighborhood. How would you like if God moved in beside you today? House is for sale. Who's moving in? God. Right? I bet you keep your grass cut. But anyway, here's, here's God's right in this neighborhood. And, and he's holy. And they're not. And so he gives all these instructions to teach them what it means to be in his presence, to be holy. Now, this word holy has, all right, you want to learn a Hebrew word so you can wire your friends at lunchtime today. Say kadosh. Kadosh. Come on, come on, come on. You do better than that. Say kadosh. kadosh. Good, very good. That's the Hebrew word for holy. Now you're speaking two languages today, all right? So you go to the Mexican restaurant and order burritos. You spoke three in one day, all right? So, Kadosh, right? And there's only one Mexican restaurant. <laughs> right? Wrong. Okay, there's more than one. There's some people who need to repent. But anyway. <laughs> Kadosh has three compartments to it. Three things to understand holiness. The first one is unique. God is set apart. He is completely different. You might have, if you ever notice how men make idols, they make idols in, that have representation of man or animals, but God's nothing like that. God is completely holy. He is set apart, completely unique. Second thing is, God is a source of life. God does not entertain death. Death was not his invention. Don't blame God for death. Death is a result of the consequence of man's choices, all right? Sin has entered the world through one man, Adam, Paul says in Romans, and because of that, all people die. And then the third thing is that God is powerful. He's lacking in nothing. God is completely happy with himself all the time. <clears throat> have you ever said to yourself, or maybe you said it aloud, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Some of you parents said it on the way to, you know, <laughs> after you got in the car. <clears throat> God had never says that. He never says about himself. He's completely happy with himself. He's complete in every aspect. He is lacking in nothing. My wife and I had our first camping adventure in this camper we bought. And she wore a t-shirt yesterday that said, please forgive me for everything I said when you were trying to park the camper. All right? So, (laughs) isn't that funny? That's pretty funny. All right. So, anyway... uh, (laughs) So, so, so are, you, are you grasping holy? God's powerful. He's unique. He's a source of life. Like he's completely set apart from anything we know and understand. And God says, now you be like me. I'm like, wait a minute. I'll quit cussing and chewing and doing all that stuff. But to be like you? Come on. All right. So there's a rules that are given in the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, to help explain how that happens. Now, I'm going to try to illustrate this by talking about a hospital. How many have been to a hospital? Okay, lots of you. How many have been in an operating room? Some of you. 
Lots of us have been to the hospital. Not every one of us has been in an operating room, praise God. But is there a difference between a hospital and the operating room? And we would all say, yes. I mean, the operating room is set apart to saving life and improving life. And a specific quality of life is, uh, is sought to be attained in that space and nowhere else. Uh, who else can go in that room? Just anybody? No, the farmer down the road? No, he can't go in there. You know, the tax cap? No, he can't go in there. The biker at the sheets? Right? No, he can't go in there. I mean, who goes in there? Prepared person, right? Somebody who's been to med school, someone who's done their internship, uh, nurses that have uh, done a specific training in this, uh, you know, certain surgery, right? All prepared people. And then there's these rituals they do. Does anybody know what I'm doing right now when I do this? Right? <laughs> I mean, as a kid, I knew the doctor was getting ready to go in, and there's a nurse that puts the gloves on. I don't know if they, I don't know if they ever did that, but that's what I, and I think of clean hands. And so there's these rituals, right, that have to be done because you can't, you don't want your doctor going in there, you know, and he's sneezing in your brain cavity or something like that. I mean, that's nasty, and that is not going to go well. So, so here's what I'm saying. Like, there's all this cleanliness that has to happen, Right? A specific person in a specific place to get a a life-saving task done. Holy. Are you tracking with me? God is holy, and he tells Israel to become holy. He defines that they must become a prepared people. They must get ready to go into the holy place. And so we have all these rules about sacrifices and cleansings and, and all types of rituals to prepare us to go into the holy place because we're unclean. And we want to go into a space where God is absolutely perfectly clean. Okay? Tracking? Got it? All right. Now, your second most favorite book in the Bible is the book of Numbers, right? Everybody got up and read Numbers today, right? I'm sh- Some of you go like, what's he talking about? All right. So the Lord said to Moses, command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or a discharge of any kind. Or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away the male and female alike. Send them outside the camp so they will not defile the camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did so. They sent outside the camp. They did just as the Lord instructed. Now, some of you, if you've never read this book before, reading the Bible is a cross-cultural experience, right? It's not written to... I mean, the first audience that gets this are the Israelites in the desert. They've just been slaves. They've been taught that, that Ra, the sun god of Egypt, created the world. And, and so everything's new to them, and they're learning this. And this may seem strange to us, but it had great significance to them. So just like a surgeon does not, you know, deliver a calf out in the field, if there is a surgeon who's a farmer and a doctor, there might be. Haskins, is there such a person? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, all right. But anyway, they go from the field. Yep, that calf's clean. All right, we're good. All right, let's go do brain surgery. No, that's not going to happen. And you don't want that to happen because of the danger that it would bring. That person's not clean. So you just don't waltz into an operating room. You have to go through the process of that. Now, In this passage of Scripture, there are three ways of becoming unclean. The first one is a skin disease. Hmm. Are we talking about a skin disease today? Yes, we are. Leprosy. The second one, any bodily discharges. Now, I hope (laughs) I don't have to teach anything right now. Let me just say that again. Any bodily discharges. Is that enough? Are we good? Okay, we're moving on. All right, any bodily discharges or touching dead bodies, that would make you unclean. That would make you unclean, and you can't come into the presence of God. The reason they're all unclean is because all of these categories are associated with death. And death does not enter the source of life's presence, okay? Now, you must first become clean.
through the ritual process. Now, I just want to be clear, just a side note, as an aside, just, just because a person became unclean didn't mean they sinned. Like, they had a dead calf, and they had to bury it. That was the procedure. So they had to go outside the camp. They had to make a sacrifice. There were so many days they were separated, all right? Sometimes sin did make a person unclean. But I, I'm just trying to say now that, that the process of becoming clean is, is very well laid out and, and observed. Now, let's move forward 500 years to a prophet, a preacher, a man named Isaiah, okay, Isaiah. Now, <clears throat> Isaiah comes into the presence of God in a dream, in a vision. And he says, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, I'm a dead man, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew at me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. All right, let me explain this a little bit. Isaiah is a preacher, a prophet, a man of God living in Jerusalem. He goes to sleep or maybe he has it awake, a divine vision. We don't know. But he, ha he, he imagines himself, or he's actually brought him into the place, we don't know. He's in the presence of God, and as a priest, as one who knows the law, he knows he's unclean, and now he's in the holy presence of God, and he knows he's a dead man. He's done. He has no hope. He's an unclean person. Some of us struggle. The reason we have the law is to teach us what clean and unclean is. Let me illustrate this with my own life. I have white t-shirts. Well, no, I probably don't. I, I had a white t-shirt, right? And all I have now are gray. And I might put on a white shirt, and my wife might say, hey, that's not a white shirt anymore. And I'm like, hmm? You know, what? It, yeah, it looks white to me. But if I take that gray shirt off and I lay it beside a white shirt, I'm like, uh. see, that's the purpose of the law. The law is to teach us what sin is, to show us that we're not clean and Here's what the scripture says, and this might be a shocker for some of you. On your best day, on your own, you cannot be clean before God. So Isaiah knows he's in trouble. And then it gets really interesting. Because this angel, a class of angels called a seraphim, which are horribly terrifying things that God has created. They can fly any direction at any time. They're amazingly strong, and they protect God's throne. So like... You're a loser if you come up against one of these. I don't care how tough you are. This seraphim goes to the altar of God and takes a coal with a pair of tongs and flies towards Isaiah. Now, it's Memorial Weekend. Most of you are going to barbecue. What if I was to invite you over at my house and I had a big old kettle pot of coals burning I'm going to get the hamburgers on, right? You tracking with me? And I take one of those tongs and I reach in there, and I take a hot coal, and I start coming for you, and I'm going to place this on your mouth. What's your reaction? Ah, it's weirdo. Go to McDonald's, right? Like, we would be terrified. This was terrifying for Isaiah. This terrifying angel with a coal we don't know how big flies to him and sticks it on his mouth. Isaiah thought... He would die. But just the opposite happened. God's holiness cleansed him. This scripture is the beginning of a divine reversal in the Bible. This moment where God has taught man what sin is. Now he's teaching man he can't clean himself up. He needs divine intervention. He needs divine help. God needs to step in and cleanse him of his impurities. No longer are human impurities defiling God's presence. But God's holiness is cleansing believers. And so the Mosaic Law defines sin and its consequences and also defined the need of redemption that would require outside help. 
And so all of us, I don't care how good you think you are, all of us need outside help to clean ourselves up. We need something more than just a moral code. We need the source of all morality. The separation between God and humans caused by sin has come to an end. And here's what you need to understand. Have you ever had one of these moments where you have said to yourself, man, I hope when I go to church today, I just want to get close to God. I really want to worship today. I really want to come into God's presence. Like, I just, I want, I want to go out in the woods. I want to open up my Bible. I want to have this moment with God. You've, ever, you've, ever, you've had those moments, right? You know what? God never intended for you to have that moment. He always intended for us to be in His presence. And so the reason we struggle with coming close to God is because we've been separated by God. And you know what separated us? Our unholiness, our uncleanness, our sin. And now we know by this story, which is a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus, that God is coming to be with us. Now, when Jesus was, was born, one of the titles that he received was Emmanuel, which means God with us. God came to us. God saving us. God cleansing us. God has stepped out of the holy place and stepped into the dirty place called earth. And he's with us. So, when Jesus... It's a leper and Jesus, all right? When Jesus reaches out and touches this man. I'm sure everyone went, oh no, Jesus is going to be unclean, right? Jesus is going to have leprosy. Jesus is going to have to stay away from everyone. The impurity of that man is going to infect Jesus. That's what the book of Leviticus has taught for centuries. But Jesus steps in, and you know what? His cleanness cleans the leper. This is a moment where everybody's category about God, sin, Savior has changed. If you witnessed this event on the day it happened and you were a Jew, um, you went home all night trying to figure out what just happened. Because you, you don't have a category for it. You don't have a box to put it in. Like, God showed up and did something you never expected. Totally unheard of. Somebody online, maybe somebody in here, our sin, our sin, our corruption, our sin, our failure is not threatening to Jesus. He's not afraid of it. One of my favorite preachers of past, Fred Craddock, graduate of Johnson, as a matter of fact, but where I went to school. But anyway, he, he has this quote. I want to read it to you. Listen. All the way to the cross, Jesus will be trying to get those who think where the Messiah is, there is no misery, unquote, to accept a new perspective, quote, where the Messiah, where there is misery, there is the Messiah. Isn't that great? If you're the most miserable person on earth, guess who's sitting beside you? Now, this is a one-point sermon. I've written it out all but one word. Here's the truth I want you to go home on. Jesus' holiness removes our sinfulness. It's not our uncleanness making God unclean. Now, think about a time when you blew it. Okay? <laughs> My wife just said that's easy. Think about a time when you did something mama said not to do. Think about a time when you acted against your conscience. 
you acted, acted against the instruction that you knew from Scripture. Think of the time you high-handedly sinned against God. Prom night. <laughs> Guy weekend. Girl weekend. Overseas in a military operation. First year at college. I don't know. Like you think of that time when you completely blew it. What happens inside of us? What's, what's going on inside of us? We think God is ashamed of us, right? We, we, just, we just pray all the time, right? No, you avoid prayer, just like I did. Uh, when somebody invites you to church, you're like, no, no. I've heard it. I've said it. The roof will fall down on me if I walk into church. Right? Can I get a witness? Anybody with me? You read your Bible all the time, don't you? You can't wait to open up your Bible after you just blew it. God can tolerate our sin in His presence. Are you getting this? We believe God wants nothing to do with us because of our failure, and you could not be more wrong. He reaches out and touches us. God moves towards the hopeless sinner, the leper, with compassion. There's a story. It's called the prodigal son, and the father runs to the son. This is throughout Jesus' ministry. Sin, our sin, is not threatening to Jesus. And so maybe there's someone here today who thinks God wants nothing to do with them, but you are so, so wrong. I want to illustrate this quickly. I'm almost out of, I'm out of time, but I'm going to do it anyway. Some of you my age know Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, but some of you watched it on Netflix recently. And he was a serial killer, killed 17 men, dismembered them, kept body parts with them so he could, they could always be with him. Unclean? Yeah. After his capture and conviction, Jeffrey was led to Christ by Kurt Booth and Roy Ratcliffe. I heard Roy preach his message about his conversion about six months after he was murdered in prison. Most people wanted Jeffrey Dahmer to get the electric chair. God wanted to save him. Now that's hard for us to grasp. But I'm telling you, that's my God. And you think your sin has marginalized you out of God's grace. You're so wrong. You're so wrong. So, I mean, what's your next step? Well... Do what the Christian killer Paul was instructed to do. Ananias told the Christian killer Paul, well, his name was Saul then, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. The reason baptism has such significance, to me anyway, is it's this idea of like being washed clean of all sin and shame and guilt and everything, piece of baggage with it, right? To be brand new. To be made right with God. I, you know, like, I know it's 12 o'clock. You've got plans. But man, have you ever thought of what it's like to live a life free of shame and guilt and knowing that you don't have to wonder anymore if you're in God's presence? Does, oh, I wish I could get close to God. God's like, you're in my family. You're, we're, we're having dinner together. We call that communion. We're having, we're having a walk together. When, I, when you read my word to you, it's like I'm talking straight at you. Like, I just, I just want you to know that if you've ever felt so dirty, so ashamed, and you were certain God was willing to condemn you, I want you to be certain of this truth from this scripture from this message today, God is certainly wanting to clean you up and touch you and be, be with you.
Jesus cleansed the leper. The coal of God's altar cleansed Isaiah. God's got this plan to redeem all mankind. But you have to be, you have to, like the leper, you have to come to him. There's something you must do. (laughs) Ask for help. So we're going to end this message here today. There's more to be said, but I'm going to be standing up here. And if you want to be baptized today, if you want to talk, maybe you've been baptized, you just want to, you just want someone to pray with you, help you work through this. I'll be here as long. Church will end. I'll still be up here to whoever wants to talk. Jesus completely saves.